I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Alyssa Azar, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thank you for having me. Well, Alyssa, I have to say, since news broke here in Australia of your remarkable recent accomplishment in summiting Everest to be Australia's youngest uh, person to have ever done that, I was, um, I thought, wow, that would be fascinating to get behind the curtain of what that took and what it entailed. So I've got to say, I've been anticipating this chat for, for some months now. Yeah, yeah, it's great to be on here and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So, Well, Alyssa, I'd like to start with something straight out of the gate that uh, for someone that's done what you've done, I, uh, I'll be interested in your answer. What's something that scares Alyssa Azar? I think something that scares me is... Probably not being fulfilled is probably what I fear most and uh, I guess not living up to my own expectations. Mm, so, wow. So have you experienced that in your, you know, life to date, not being fulfilled? You know, I think uh, with climbing, I, I mostly do feel that I am fulfilled. I mean, obviously, there have been expeditions that weren't completely what I wanted or, or successful necessarily, but I've always found that I've learnt from that, and so uh, I think that in itself has helped fulfil me as well as the, the successful expeditions. So you feel that the ones that haven't gone quite how you wanted, like because I believe there was three expeditions to get finally to the summit and those yeah. factors are outside of your control. Um, but they really, do you think they burned the fires even more intensely to, to one day crack the, crack the summit? Yeah, I think so. And yeah, you just feel like there's sort of more on the line and particularly when you've had a few opportunities, even when it is outside your control to, to really get it right when your time does come to, to go for the summit. <sighs> So let's talk, let's reverse engineer, I think. Uh, let's, no, let's not. Let's go from first principles. So by that I mean a young girl from Toowoomba slash Brisbane. Uh, you're residing in Brisbane now, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. yep. And you're 19 years of age now? Yes. Yep. So how does a young girl uh, growing up in Brisbane slash Toowoomba ever start to dream about one day climbing the summit of Mount Everest? Yeah, it's funny. For me, it all started really through my dad. Uh, he was and still is a, a guide on the Kokoda track, and he's been doing that since I was about, God, four or five years old. And uh, I was always quite active, very into sports. And on the weekends, he would often do an eight-week training program with his clients in the lead-up to a Kokoda track crossing. And I used to just go out on the weekends and do pack training and bushwalks and hikes, and it was like my favorite thing to do. And yeah, I really got hooked on that and the idea of going to Kokoda myself one day and I don't even really know where it came from but even pretty much since then I always had this dream of maybe one day I'll climb Mount Everest and I didn't even know much about it but I just yeah I was fascinated by it and so uh, yeah I think it's always been something that's captivated me. So that's so that was even at a young age of you know less than 10. Yeah yeah I think I was about eight when I can remember at first you know thinking of Everest so yeah. Wow and uh, and (laughs) so you were eight years of age when most of your friends are probably thinking about, I don't know what eight-year-old girls think about. I've got a, uh, <laughs> a three-year-old little girl and a three-week-old little girl. Um, so wh- whatever they were thinking about, you were thinking about Everest. So the Kokoda Trail, you said your father, Glenn, uh, has been and still is a uh, tour guide on that that trail. When I was researching for this interview, uh, Alyssa, I read that you were or have been were Australia's youngest uh, person at eight years of age to do the Kokoda trek or trail. Is that right? Yeah, actually, our youngest person at the time, I think it was. And, yeah, that was back in 2005 when I was eight. Wow. 
And uh, what was that like, Kokoda? I mean, it's a, I'm sure it's on, it's actually on my bucket list. So when you said your father's still a guide, I'm like, I need to speak to Glenn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I thought it was an amazing trip and, and very tough. But, uh, yeah, I was really, really, you know, proud of myself because I went through all the training and, and I succeeded in that goal. And, yeah, it's still, uh, you know, one of my greatest memories today. So 96, it's 96 kilometres, correct? Yeah, 96 kilometres, and it's in the Owen Stanley Range in the jungles of Papua New Guinea. So, and uh, did you at any point as an eight-year-old feel like you might not have gotten through that, or that was uh, just a bit of a warm-up for what was to come you know, some <laughs> 11 years later or eight, 10 years later? I remember the first day being quite tough because you're sort of getting into your rhythm when you're trekking and uh you know I'd done a lot of trek training in the lead up but the hard part was obviously that it's much steeper than anything back in Australia and you kind of got to do it back to back to back but once I got my rhythm I really enjoyed it um even the challenging parts and yeah once I really got into it I I actually loved the trip and it was challenging but yeah I remember uh, still even at that age having sort of a fascination with Everest and I thought maybe one day that would be on the cards yeah Wow. Okay. So off the back of the Kokoda track, what came next? There's somewhere in here, the 10 peaks in Australia. Is that right? Yeah. So actually after that, um, two years later was Everest Base Camp, the trek to Everest Base Camp, um, which once again, my dad and I did together and neither of us had done that trip at that point. So that was kind of new for us. But yeah, we wanted to sort of go to another area and take on another challenge. So that was the next one. And then two years after that was the uh, the Aussie 10 peaks, the 10 highest peaks in Australia. And they're all down in Kosciuszko National Park and takes usually about two days to do. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, and did they compare any way, shape, or form to um, Kokoda, the rigors yeah. of Kokoda? Yeah, I, I, you know, Kokoda um, is incredibly challenging. The thing with Everest Base Camp, though, is obviously the altitude. So, uh, yeah, I think all in their own ways are, are fairly equally challenging. So, uh, even the Aussie Ten can can be. There's some big days on that one. So, yeah. And uh, so, at what age had you conquered Australia's ten highest peaks, Alyssa? So I was twelve when I did that one. So that was the next goal done. Yes. <laughs> All right. So you're 12. You're going to school um, in Brisbane. Yes. Yep. And how much of your world at this stage was the Everest Summit? Was it still something that sat out there or was this now starting to become more tangible? Yeah, you know, I think at that point it was still, you know, I wasn't really thinking too much about it. I mean, Everest, like I said, was sort of a dream of mine, but I was really just focusing on each trek as it came along. And at that time I wasn't looking at, uh, you know, to go to Everest, but uh, two years after I did the Aussie 10 peaks, I went to Mount Kilimanjaro, which was my biggest challenge at that point. And it was actually on Kilimanjaro I decided that I was actually going to pursue Everest as a real goal now. So what happened on uh, Kilimanjaro to, to trigger that as a as you just say as a real goal rather than a, you know out there dream? Yeah, I think uh, around the time, even while I was preparing for Kilimanjaro, I didn't really know what would be after that, and I was enjoying all these trips, but I I wanted to do more of it and get more involved, and just felt like I could achieve a lot more in not just trekking, but maybe eventually climbing. I saw that as sort of the next step to what I was doing, and so yeah, I think that was something that was sort of in my head, and and that's when thoughts of Everest started to come back, and I remember you know, that sort of being my dream and thought about pursuing it. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, once I had summoned Kilimanjaro, it was actually, I was sort of on my way back down um, the mountain when I seriously thought, you know, I want to have a go at this. Yeah, right. So Kilimanjaro uh, is what altitude? It's 5,895 meters. Okay. And did you encounter any major challenges on the Kilimanjaro summit? Yeah, you know, like I said, that was my toughest one at the time. I hadn't been at that altitude yet, and so it it was pretty good up until, like, the summer day is probably the toughest day. It's just long in comparison to the other ones, and with Kilimanjaro, you're ascending quite quickly. So, uh, yeah, it was definitely challenging, uh, that altitude at the time. Yeah, and did your father go with you on this one? Yeah, he did. Um, So he he was uh, leading that trek as well, and, yeah, so we both went over there and uh, did it together. 
Oh, what a what a great uh, what a great uh, father and daughter um, memory. And mum, what was mum doing through this? Was mum at home holding the fort? Have you got brothers or sisters? Yeah, so I have uh, one brother, two sisters. So yes, my mum was at home with them. Oh wow, where are you in the birth order, Alyssa? I am the second one. So I have an older sister, a younger brother, and then a younger sister as well. Okay, so mum was uh, keeping keeping all your siblings uh, keeping all your yeah. siblings together, and and were they communicating with you on this? Uh, Kilimanjaro summit? Um, you know, not much. I mean, I did, uh, I was able to call back home via satellite from the summit. Um, but other than that, yeah, it was pretty much uh, no contact on the mountain otherwise. Okay. So, all right. So Kilimanjaro down 10 peaks of Australia down, done, mm-hmm. I should say, and Kokoda track done all by the age of what, 12 or 13 or is that uh, the 14. Okay, 14. Okay, yeah. so 14. So um, just pausing for a moment, you said that there were other sports that you used to do as a, as a, as a, a you know, a youngster. Uh, you're still very much a youngster, but uh, even youngster, youngster. What were they? Uh, was there anything else competing for your interests or were you really now starting to be like, you know what, this is the thing that, you know, I enjoy most? Yeah, when I was, uh, you know, sort of in in primary school, I was into a lot of different sports at school uh, until I got into trekking, and that really became my main focus. But I actually was also uh, competitively boxing at the time, um, just sort of locally in Queensland and won an Australian title at one point. But, uh, yeah, as I started to get into the trekking and then eventually the climbing, that really took over my focus, and I knew that that was what I wanted to do. Yeah, okay. So, and was there any, what was it about the trekking that you so enjoyed? I think it was just the, the challenge of it. Uh, you know, I, I always liked it, and I think I was always, all, and even now, quite uh, introverted in many ways, and so it, I just liked being out there with a pack on for hours at a time, and that was sort of my element and my rhythm. And then once I sort of got into a little bit more of mountaineering, I really felt like that was uh, sort of my place, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So, okay, so you, you've discovered a love for the mountains and, and, and I, I, I read here in my research that you were quoted as saying that you have a love for being in the mountains. If you can find what you love to do when you're passionate about it, you just put your all in. So uh, you strike me as someone that even before you discovered the love for the mountains that you were kind of an all-in person. Is that a fair estimation of your character? Yeah, I would say definitely. Everything is kind of all or nothing with me. <laughs> and, and where do you think you get that from, Melissa? Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I definitely my mum and, and maybe even my dad, I think we're, we're all sort of like that. Um, but, yeah, it was always like that from a very young age. No matter what I did, it was always in or out kind of thing and uh, throw my all into it. So, yeah. Okay. So you're all in. You've done a lot. And then what happens between 14 years of age and your uh, successful attempt to the summit at 18 years of age? Somewhere in the middle there you've had to yeah, you take on two – two uh, attempts and they both are unsuccessful due to events. Can you, can you walk us through what's happened over these next few years, just in chronological order? Yeah, yeah. So when I got back from Kilimanjaro, I really had to look at realistically how I make Everest happen and, and get into climbing. Um, so the first thing I did was booked a, a mountaineering course in New Zealand and so I went over there for 10 days and we did everything from crevasse rescuing to ice climbing, uh, you know, transceiver searches so you can find someone in an avalanche we did all of the mountaineering skills and once I knew all the basics uh, you know that same year I went back to Everest Base Camp uh, you know and and that was pretty special to know that this is the the mountain that I'm going to be trying to climb and uh, yeah also did another Kokoda track crossing as well and the next year uh, my preparation went up again and you know throughout all this period even back home I was doing a lot of physical and mental training of trained with a few different sort of special forces guys who put me through my paces to be ready just for the challenge that I'm trying to take on. And yeah, so I did, uh, did, we did the Aussie 10 peaks again. And then that same year, this is in 2013, I went to my biggest climb at the time, which is a mountain called Mount Manaslu. And that's the eighth highest mountain in the world. And it's also one of the most dangerous mountains in the world. Um, So that was a huge challenge. And that would sort of prove whether I was ready for Everest and, so that went well, and uh, a few months after that one, this is while I was 17, I went to South America to climb one of the seven summits, Mount Aconcagua, and then pretty much two months after that, it was onto my first ever Everest expedition, and so my first expedition, I was 17, and that was in 2014, and the Everest season is in April, May, so I went over there and 
But basically how it works is we fly into Kathmandu and then we begin the trek into base camp. I climb from the Nepal side and so done the trek into base camp and it's a two-month expedition. So once we get there, we sort of prepare for the climb ahead. We organise all our gear and start to get ready to get acclimatised. And we'd been there for a week or so just in base camp getting organised and one morning on, I think it was April 18th in 2014, there was a an avalanche in the Kumbu Icefall, which is sort of the first uh, section of climbing on Everest, and it killed uh, 16 Sherpas. And at the time, it was the, the biggest accident in, I think, Himalayan climbing history. And so that and I think a lot of uh, things politically in Nepal that happened after that effectively shut the season down and, and we all had to go home. And so... You know, after that, I sort of had to assess, yeah, I guess where I go from there. And I definitely knew that my dream of Everest was not over and, and it's something that I was still really looking to pursue. So uh, later that year, I decided I was going to go back to Everest and have another go if I could. And so I went back to Nepal, um, climbed another peak called Amadablam, which is quite a technical climb and it's not far from Everest. Then in 2015, uh, same season, April, May, went back for my second attempt on the mountain and I was 18 at the time. So a year later, a year later from your yep. first one, yep, I understand. Yeah, exactly one year later, the same climbing season and, uh, yeah, 2015. And uh, same thing, we'd done the trek into base camp. Um, we'd been there for a few weeks this time doing some acclimatisation. We did a little bit of climbing in the icefall and, Literally the day that we were supposed to start climbing on our first rotation up the mountain, the Nepal earthquake hit. Yeah, so we were in a base camp at the time and that earthquake triggered a series of avalanches because you're surrounded by mountains. And usually base camp's pretty safe, but uh, it wasn't because of the earthquake. And a lot of uh, camps, including ours, were pretty much destroyed and we knew straight away. I mean, we didn't know the magnitude straight away of... of how heavily Nepal was affected, but uh, yeah, we pretty much knew the season would be over after that. Gosh, so twice you were in base camp when these uh, natural disasters struck. Is that so? You were, yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, Alyssa, uh, the 2015 earthquake was devastating. It killed you know over 3,000 people. Correct. Yeah, yep. And did you have an idea of the magnitude of what was happening when you were bunkered down at base camp? Not while we were in base camp. So that day, I mean, when it hit, it was around midday and I was in my um, singular tent in base camp and, uh, yeah, pretty much got destroyed, almost got buried uh, under an avalanche and managed to sort of get myself out and same with the rest of our team. And we were told that, you know, to get down to the nearest um, tea house, which is along the trek to base camp, so effectively a few hours out of base camp to try and get to a safer place as there were going to be aftershocks. And yeah, it wasn't until we got sort of down um, the valley a little bit that we, you know, I managed to get a little bit of contact with my dad, who was obviously watching it all over the news back in Australia. And Gosh. he sort of told me the magnitude of what had happened. And yeah, we had no idea. So a couple of things here, Alyssa. So your father was back home in, uh, in Australia, um, yeah. you know, watching on uh who were you traveling with at this stage were you over there with anyone that you'd been doing a lot of training with or actually no so uh the teams that i was with i were just international climbers um so i was just with a sort of a logistics company who i, I climbed through when they sort of organize um, a lot of the logistics over in country and yeah you're frankly effectively just climbing with you and a sherpa so um, a lot of international climbers we had a few people um, from south africa that i was climbing with um, some from the uk and so yeah just uh, people i'd never climbed with before and uh, i was over there with them so no familiar faces so to speak and, and describe like what what's the avalanche what what did it sound like like did you did you think you're in trouble like I mean I just presume uh it's it's deafening is it it is yeah so uh I, w I was in my tent and uh, just sort of reading and and um, hanging out there because we had sort of an extra day in base camp and uh yeah I remember the earthquake happening the ground shaking and it sort of took a second to process what it was and I just remember hearing this sound out the back of my tent and so I, I unzipped it and looked out and I could just see this wall of white coming toward base camp and you could see nothing but avalanches so zipped my tent up really quick and jumped to the front of it and uh, created an air pocket so that if I was to get buried, I could still breathe for a little bit and, and maybe one of my team members could come out and help. But I, I was lucky that 
the zip to my tent was uncovered and most of it was destroyed, but not that section. So I was able to uh, get out and then obviously make sure we look for anyone we can and, and help out. And so how close did the avalanche come, Alyssa, to your tent? Um, well, it, my tent got sort of buried and it was mostly broken um, and a lot of our camp was destroyed. But, uh, yeah, it was literally that front little vestibule section of the tent that was okay and um, that's the, the reason I was able to get out. Gosh, so – and what was going through your head as, you know, you zipped that tent up and made the air pocket? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It happened so quickly within seconds and I pretty much went straight into reaction mode and, you know, I stayed really calm and just went, all right, this is what I need to do. And, yeah, you're sort of thinking really quickly, but it's later on that you sort of reflect on it and you realise sort of how close that was. But, yeah, at the time it was just reaction mode straight away. Did anyone lose their life in that 2015 avalanche around base camp there? Yeah, I think we had about 20 die in base camp that year. So it was a big year and, once again, the another worst accident um, in, in Himalayan history for, for climbing. So, Gosh, so you got back to safety there and, and flew home. Yeah. Uh, what were your spirits like at that stage? Two natural disasters, two consecutive years. What were you thinking? Yeah, you know, it was pretty tough and, and a whole heap of mixed emotions, obviously, with everything that happened in Nepal. Uh, you know, I've been going to Nepal since I was 10 and it's definitely a special place to me. But then there is that part of you that thinks all the hard work and dedication just to get to Everest and to then once again not have the opportunity was incredibly difficult. And there's part of you that starts to doubt if you'd ever get the opportunity and God was all the hard work worth it. And I sort of had to really reassess, you know, do I want to go back? Do I want to try this again? I didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. And it didn't take long after being home to think, you know, I really still want to have a try at this, but who knows what the state of climbing is and the state of the country. And so I really didn't know. Uh, if I could get back there a third time and, uh, yeah, make it happen. But uh, ultimately that's what I decided to do. And when you got home, was there any withdrawal of support from people that, uh, you know, previously been in your corner cheering you on after the, you know, after this big earthquake disaster? Did I imagine some people's enthusiasm would have been, you know, dampened about you going back? Yeah, definitely. I think there were even some sponsors who were sort of a little bit disappointed with the outcome, obviously. But, uh, yeah, you never know with these things, and, and that's just part of climbing is so you're relying so much on your environment. And so, yeah, there was definitely a little bit of that. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I sort of had a few people that I really trusted around me, but not many, and I'm pretty sure not many people thought, you know, I, I could do it or it was going to happen. And so uh, I just tried to surround myself with people who, who believed in me and, and in the climb and, yeah, so that's ultimately what helped me sort of get through. That was a pretty tough year, 2015. And throughout that, so you're back into the training, Alyssa, um, for what would be your third attempt. Yeah. What, throughout that training, just describe for listeners your training regime across a sort of a week in preparation. You know, what, what would that look like? Yeah, so often I'll train sort of six days a week, uh, morning and night, uh, and that can be anything from – gym sessions to a lot of pack training sessions so I'll go out in the hills of wherever I can Mount Cuther and um, sometimes if I'm up in Toowoomba I'll go out there and, and just uh, train with a heavy pack on for hours at a time to get my body used to that um, yeah I do a lot of gym sessions with uh, cardio body weight strength weights to to make myself stronger for the climb and and often I'll, I'll use a gas mask as well to sort of build my lung capacity and uh, I've even done a little bit of a sort of underwater training before to do the same thing so yeah there's a lot of sort of different uh, methods that we use yeah and uh was there any favorite session that you had in the lead up to your successful summit in you know in 2016 I don't know about a favourite session. I mean, I think always the pack ones are the most effective for me because that's effectively what I am training for is that's what I'm going to be doing on the mountain. Um, so, yeah, that, they're probably my favourite sessions uh, to, to just still go out and train with a pack on. And, you know, that's what I've been doing from training for Kokoda right through to Everest. So I always enjoy that. 
So you just load it up with some heavy objects and weights and off you go. Yep, sandbags and uh, yeah, up the hill. <laughs> uh, Alyssa, you, uh, you remind me of, uh, in that capacity, uh, a gentleman I know who I've done some actual physiotherapy work with uh, on the Gold Coast and he's a future uh, guest on this show, but you probably know him, Jeff Wilson, the Antarctica ex- expedition that he did uh, unassisted there a couple of years ago, dragging the, <laughs> the now famous boob sled. And when Jeff came in, Alyssa, to uh, see me, he uh, said, I've hurt my back directly dragging some very uh, heavy tyres up a very steep incline. So um, <laughs> I'm picturing, you know, a female version of Jeff out there, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done that a few of the tyre drag <laughs> sessions there. They're good ones. <laughs> so fantastic. So you're, you're feeling fit, prepared. Um, you get back on the plane to head back, you know, via Kathmandu to take on your third expedition. Um, is there any doubt in your mind? You know, it's interesting, not at that point, and I think uh, definitely that's something that was sort of a mental barrier in sort of end of 2015 and preparing for the expedition, but I knew I had to get that out of my head if I was going to have the opportunity. I mean, I, I had to believe in the climb and, and give it 100% and know in my head, okay, this is going to happen. And so, yeah, it was definitely hard and it took me a while to sort of push those doubts out. But by the time I got on the plane, I was just 100% ready to go and, and I truly believed uh, in the climb. But yeah, I guess you never know with the previous two seasons. So, and at this point, you got your full support of your loved ones. I, I mean, I can't imagine I'm a dad of two girls and I, uh, you know, can only imagine the you know, you'd want them to excel and fulfill their potential and live out their dreams. But, and, you know, you wouldn't stop that for anything, but, you know, you'd feel so helpless. I imagine as a parent, you know, waiting on the other side of the world. And dare I say, it wasn't probably just, you know, your local, your your immediate family, but at this point, you know, a lot of the nation waiting on how you were going to hear. So, uh, you know, what did your parents say to you as you left? Yeah, you know, it's funny. They're they're pretty used to it, I guess, and so uh, it was pretty casual when I left. Um, you know, I d- just went and hung out with my family, uh, my mum and my siblings, you know, the day before, and uh, my dad took me to the airport, and, yeah, so, uh, you know, he, he actually said to me, uh, I don't want to see you till June this time, once you've done it, uh, you know, two months later, because he, he knew how badly I wanted to do it, and uh, he actually was on Kokoda when I was over on Everest. So we were sort of connecting sat phone to sat phone. So, yeah. Wow. So, okay, so you're back over there. Um, In a minute I want to read the little media release that went out uh, that caught my attention. Um, which I think is a beautiful little piece. So you're over there this time. You get you you're back to base camp, and then you start to to push further. Take take us through that journey from base camp through to the summit. And for those you know that are familiar, I think you'll still enjoy this. For me, I'm certainly not familiar. I, I'm very interested to hear what the next steps are. Yeah, so like I said, it's a two-month expedition, and the reason is we have to do what's called rotations in order to acclimatise. So once we get to base camp, we get all our gear sorted, and then we start our first rotation through the icefall. So we climb from base camp, we leave at about 2 o'clock in the morning, so head torches on and it's pitch black, and we head up through the icefall, and uh, we head to camp one, where we'll spend the night on our first rotation. And then usually we'll go up and touch camp two, spend maybe an hour there, and then and sleep again at camp one with uh, the idea being that if we climb high and sleep low it'll help us acclimatize so then we come back to base camp and that's our first rotation done so we'll spend a few days in base camp and then once again we go up for our second rotation but this time we go from base camp all the way to camp two which is about an 11 hour climb and uh, once again we start out at two o'clock in the morning go through that dangerous section of the ice fall and uh yeah get up to camp two which is at 6,500 meters and then we'll spend about two nights there and uh we'll go up a little bit higher and, and touch camp three the next day and then we come back down to camp two for one more night and back down to base camp and so that's our second rotation and the final one and then we'll usually take about five to seven days and we'll sit in base camp watching weather forecasts, we get updates each day and sort of planning when our summit push is going to be. And so once we get those dates, we get organised, get all our gear ready for the summit push, and then from there it's a five-day climb from base camp to the summit. So we go base camp straight to camp two, we'll have a rest day in camp two the next day, then we climb up the Lotsy face, which is an incredibly steep section, up to camp three where we'll camp halfway up. 
And once we get to camp three that night, we're now on oxygen. Um, so from there, cause we're at about 7,300 meters starting to get into the really high altitudes. So from camp three, we then climb the next day to camp four, which is the final camp on Everest. And it sits at just under 8,000 meters, the South pole. Now, anything above 8,000 meters is called the death zone. And so we've got a limited amount of time that we can be in there. And so I think we've got about 18 hours to get up and get back out. Um, so, yeah, we don't even sleep at Camp 4. It's too high, really. So we'll, we're still on oxygen. We'll spend a few hours. Um, you try and eat something. And then pretty much that night at 8 p.m., we go for the summer push and uh, we climb through the night. And uh, once again, that summer day is, is incredibly steep and you're on a lot of ridge lines and you can see all the way across Nepal on one side and all the way across Tibet on the other. And uh, yeah, so uh, climb to the summit. Usually we'll spend about, you wouldn't want to be on there for any more than 20 minutes, which is how long we spent. And uh, yeah, then we're back out. Uh, we get back down to camp four, have about an hour rest, but then we have to go all the way back down to camp two, which is a big day. And then the next day we're back down to base camp. So it's effectively about a week, um, five days up to back down once we're acclimatized. And then we're back in base camp and that's the expedition. We begin the trek out. And it's just all so casual and you just go home. <laughs> <laughs> yep, just pack your gear and go home. Yeah, it's, um... And dad and mum say, oh, please, you didn't come home early. Um, yep. <laughs> so my goodness, you, you, you spoke like so, um, so matter of factly. So can I unpack a few of these things? I have more yeah. questions than... Then uh, my head can probably uh, articulate. So, um, Alyssa, firstly, with this base camp to summit, uh, how dangerous are these rotations you so casually spoke about? Yeah, well, like I said, we the first section of climbing is the most dangerous, and the reason being is the ice fall is a lot of seracs, which are big chunks of ice that are sort of broken up, and it's really unstable. And so that's a lot of the, the I guess, the footage and photos you might see sometimes of the ladders that we have to cross over crevasses with, and uh, yeah, and, and climb up seracs with as well. And there's a lot of avalanche hazard, and that usually takes, depending on how acclimatized you are, but that can take you know six to nine hours just to get through there. Um, up to camp one and then from there uh, to camp two is not quite as dangerous there's still a few more uh, crevasses and a little bit of avalanche danger but uh, it's just sort of a, a long climb up to camp two it's quite tough that day and uh, yeah from there camp two we go up to camp three and uh, that's an incredibly steep section um, and, and quite dangerous if you're not careful and uh, yeah pretty much from from camp two right up to the summit is is incredibly steep climbing so uh, there's there's definitely hazards all along the way of the climb and, uh, and and people, uh, from my limited knowledge, but for some reason I feel like I've heard this, they, they certainly can lose their life even on those rotations, right, camp two to camp three, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it has happened and that there was a, a climber who did fall um, this year, unfortunately, on the Lotsy face. And, uh, yeah, you've got, you've got to be really, really careful up there to clip a line and, and make sure you're on the rope properly because it's easy to, to mistake that. When you say the lotsy face, I'm, I'm envisioning a literally a an ice wall face that's sort of vertical or thereabouts. Is that am I correct or is that not correct? Yeah, yeah, that pretty much. I mean, not quite vertical, but it's incredibly steep and, uh, yeah, that's pretty much, um, yeah, it's a giant ice wall and it actually takes about two days to climb. You know, we sleep halfway up it, so. Wow. In those hanging tents. Yeah, yeah, or sort of on, uh, yeah, on the cliff face. Gosh, so you, you, you're obviously a silly question, but not afraid of heights. No. <laughs> you know, that's probably the silliest question I'll ever be asked. Um, that's my dad jokes, dad question. So, so okay, so you're uh, up the lotsy face and uh, you're using those ice picks and all of this at this stage, those ice axes and things. Is that the equipment you sort of use to get up the lotsy face? Yeah, I mean, it, not quite that steep. Uh, we do bring them, um, okay. but mostly we're using our crampons, which are the spikes that we have on our boots that, that hook into our boots. And, uh, yeah, you sort of just um, – you're able to climb up the ice with that. It sticks into the ice. Okay, so up the lotsy face. And then, uh, Alyssa, um, what's the day daylight to darkness ratio up there? I mean, how's the day break down when you're sort of up there hovering around this – you know, you said it was 18 hours, I think, at one point there um, in the death zone. But what's the daylight to when you were there doing the summit? Is it mostly dark or how has it been? 
Yeah, I mean, when we're climbing, definitely. So when we leave the final camp, you're like we left at 8 p.m. in order to try and sort of get ahead of anyone else who was climbing and, and get ahead of the winds that were potentially coming. And so we, we left a little bit earlier than usual, so we climbed predominantly in the dark and the sun was just sort of coming up as we were hitting that final summit ridge. In that, de- in, in the, you're in the death zone at this point, is that right, as you described it? Yeah, yep. Greater than 8,000. And how... Describe for listeners and myself, how would you describe your movements at this point? Yeah, you know, when you're at that altitude, it's incredibly slow and you feel like you're at maximum effort, but your body's just not moving that quickly and, and everything's starting to break down. Um, so, yeah, you you to take 10 steps is a huge effort and another 10, and you just sort of just focus on getting through each one. And um, we got up to a section called the balcony, and once you get up there, it's sort of a ridge line, a quite steep ridge line that goes up to the summit. And so uh, we had a lot of sort of fresh snowfall. And so we're like digging into the snow and breaking trail, um, my Sherpa and I. And so, yeah, it was pretty intense, but you're not moving very quickly at those altitudes and any, any effort is a lot of exertion. Mm, so, and, and you say breaking down, you mean physiologically, processes are happening yeah definitely you know the the lack of oxygen even though we are on supplemental oxygen your body still uh feels those effects you feel like you're quite slow and so yeah it's just uh you sort of got to focus on each step at a time to to push through it yeah, does it just feel like you've got you know 50 kilo boots on you just can't move quickly <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. And so how many people were with you at this point? You're above the death zone, heading yeah. north. Yeah, heading... so it, um, it was mostly my Sherpa and I climbing, actually, but uh, there were a few other team members on my expedition that I was climbing with. So we had about uh, five others that day who summited with us. And But, yeah, we, we all sort of go at our pace, and uh, it was actually myself and another woman, Melanie, who summited around the same time, and we were on the same team. But, yeah, mostly my Sherpa and I climbing that night. Okay, and where was Melanie from? Uh, so she's from the UK, uh, yeah, so uh, sort of all international climbers again and we had one other uh, Australian and, and, you know, Polish climber and so people from everywhere and, uh, yeah, we all summited sort of within hours of each other and Melanie and I within minutes of each other, so, yeah, we all sort of go at our own rhythm. And, uh, and you said, Alyssa, 20 minutes at the summit, um, in my head, uh, and I, I think most people will have seen footage and photos and, you know, different things of the summit, but it doesn't really give you the perspective. You gave us a great insight into that view. You know, I think you said Tibet on one side and Nepal on the other. Is that what you said? I think, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From, from so, the top. Uh, but what's the top like? Is it like, are we talking 10 metres by 10 or is it like a big long ridge or a big, like you could have a party up there on a football field? What's it like? <laughs> it's uh, it's not too big actually and particularly the, the top, top summit point um, is, is actually quite small and once you sort of get to that final section, you can see the prayer flags on the summit. Um, so there are prayer flags up there and a Nepalese flag and, uh, yeah, so there's a little bit of a, a space on the side but there's a very thin um, spot on the top, on the very top. So a lot of climbers will sort of wait their turn once they get up there, and there's yeah r- room for only one or two people on the very top. <laughs> and so you, and so you kind of have a little at this point, you know, give you a few minutes grace, do your thing, and then the next person comes up if there is a next person there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, this climbers coming up from the north side and and from the south side, so it's funny you'll you'll see climbers up there as well who have climbed from Tibet when you've climbed from Nepal. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, but yeah, we get up there and sort of take our photos, um, take a minute to take it all in and and head back down. Okay, let's talk about taking it all in. So your fingers, could you feel them at this point? Could you feel anything at this point? Yeah, I could. Um, you know, my, my fingers were okay. Uh, it was my summit night, though. We had a lot of frostbite this year, um, collectively as climbers, and uh, I, I was okay, but it was about minus 40 degrees. So, uh, yeah, I could only – I took um, – my outer gloves off for like a second to get some photos, but I could already within seconds start to feel them getting very, very cold. So immediately put, put my gloves back on and yeah, had to be really careful. So had you been in minus 40 degrees temperature at that point? No, actually, I think that was a, a new uh, temperature for me. Um, yeah, so I've sort of been on other peaks, but never, never that cold um, and at that time of night. So uh, yeah. Okay, so it was dark, and you, but you said the sun was coming up, so you obviously had the full, you know, the visibility because you could see Nepal, Tibet. Um, yeah. And how long? Once you so you got up there, you're on top. 
the day's out, the sun's out, you've got a great, amazing view. What's going through your head? This is the the accomplishment that you've been dreaming of for years that few yeah. ever get to experience. Yeah, you know, it was incredibly surreal, but at the same time it was just like, I don't know, all that um, sort of self-belief and all, all of that training, all that hard work, it just makes it feel like it's all come full circle and, and you truly earned that summit and it is the most amazing feeling. It's it's hard to even describe it. But, yeah, just standing up there, I sort of had to realise, oh, my God, like I'm actually standing on the summit of Everest and you imagine that moment so many times but there's nothing like actually standing there. So, yeah, I just tried to convince myself to, to sort of take it all in and go on, <laughs> on the summit. So. so what did you say to yourself? On, on the summit, take Take it in. Just pause. Breathe. Yeah, pretty much. That's yeah, pretty much what I said to myself. And uh, I, I do remember thinking, God, you know, imagine what my dad would think if, if he knew where I was right now. So uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, did they? I mean, everyone was fo- like, do you have communication from the summit? Yeah, yeah, sometimes, but um, I, I didn't that night on my sat phone, and it, honestly, it was too cold to be able to get it out. So I ended up being able to contact him that same day. But once I was closer to camp two uh, after summiting, because um, he was on Kokoda, so uh, I was able to sort of sat phone him later in the day. And uh, it was funny; it, it somehow had gotten out. So uh, my mother already knew um, once I had gotten down; she already knew that I had summited. And oh, yeah. Oh wow! So the media release. This is. What it said. It said, <clears throat> update on Alyssa's summit attempt following brief contact as communication is limited. We can confirm that Alyssa has successfully summited Mount Everest. This has been a goal she has been determined to achieve for years. Alyssa has had a share of setbacks but has never wavered in her determination. She is still on the mountain and is in good spirits. However, the journey is not over for her. The descent off the mountain is equally as challenging. It will be a couple of days before she is back into base camp. Unfortunately, we don't have any other details at this point. But we'll update as more information comes through. Your support, thoughts, and best wishes are greatly appreciated. So, what was the conversation like? With could you speak to mum and dad? At, like, uh, or you had to wait to base camp, or could you contact them in that interim on the way down? Yeah, well, um, sort of. I mean, even then, we didn't have sort of great weather by the time we'd gotten into camp too. And so I managed actually just before I'd arrived to satellite phone my dad, um, who was on Kokoda, and so he had no contact. He had no idea. He knew I was aiming to summit that day, but that's all he knew. And uh, so, yeah, uh, tried to ring at camp four, but um, couldn't get through. And, yeah, so rang him at camp two and managed to get connected. And I just said, uh, I, I summited Mount Everest, and he just sort of went oh my god and um yeah he was he was really excited and um yes yeah, so that was pretty cool being able to tell him and yeah i didn't have contact with my mum until the next day and uh i'd gone back to base camp and she had sort of messaged me and uh yeah said, said she'd seen it and uh congratulations and that they were really proud so that was cool Wow. And what about your brothers and sisters? What did they say? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I didn't really have too much contact with them even until I got back to sort of Kathmandu. But, um, yeah, yeah, was able to message them a little bit. Mm, so, okay, so they were. And, um, all right, so you, you come in. Did, by the way, did your dad have – does your dad have an ambition or has he had the dream as well to climb Everest? I mean, obviously he's an experienced trekker, mountaineer in, in of his own right. Yeah, I think, um, you know, mostly trekking um, sort of has sort of been his thing. Um, I don't know if he's ever sort of specifically wanted to climb Everest, and I, I don't think so. But, you know, he has said maybe one day he would, uh, you know, climb with me. But, uh, yeah, he's, he's never actually really sort of been into mountaineering, but I think it's a possibility one day. Okay, so watch this space potentially, hey? <laughs> All right, so you came down. And did you have any idea of how big of story this was in Australia or would be? No, actually, I didn't, and we we really didn't expect sort of the uh, the request for interviews and things that we would get. It it was really crazy back home, and, uh, yeah, so uh, he was away and I was away, and so it was absolutely hectic, and, uh, yeah, we had absolutely no idea. So what's been one of the standout opportunities that's uh, arisen since you you came home? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, you know, the, we've got a book coming out with Penguin Publishing in September, which I'm really looking forward to, uh, Key to the City in, in Toowoomba. So I'm looking forward to that as well. But uh, actually the day I got home, uh, I 
went and took my little sister into school and uh, her grade three class ended up wanting to do a whole Q&A and, uh, on the expedition and uh, <laughs> actually they, they were really excited so I quite enjoyed that one as well. Oh, wow, the simple things, right? The simple yeah. things. Wow. <laughs> so a book coming out in September um, and is this, are you at liberty to release the title or not yet? Yes, absolutely. So uh, it's by Penguin Publishing and it's called The Girl Who Climbed Everest and it, it goes right back from Kokoda through to Everest and the whole journey and it's uh, it's uh, about me but written with um, an author called Sue Williams and so, yeah, that'll be released in September. Oh, well, in advance, congratulations. Thank um, you. And I'll be eagerly looking to get that one <laughs> and probably buying a few copies, I'd say, to give out to people in my world. So this sounds like an excellent read. Um, so the book coming up, up and uh, any other opportunities that you just couldn't have imagined even off the back of such a monumental achievement? Yeah, you know, there's there's a few potential things coming up and, uh, you know, recently I've just come into um, the business sort of full-time adventure professionals that my dad and I now run and so I've got a, I think a lot of opportunities through that. You know, next year I'll be running Kokoda trips and even this year and so we've got a lot of exciting things coming up which is probably the thing I'm most excited about. Okay, so so you've got lots of lots of other side projects that have emerged in the sort of business commercial sense. Uh, yeah. You know, do you what's next? I mean, I, I, it's kind of like what do you do after winning Olympic gold? Bar back going back and defending your title. Um, you know, what's next? You've climbed Everest. What's next on the on the physical challenge front? Yeah, so I think next for me will be the seven summits, which is the highest point on each of the seven continents, and it's uh, another mountaineering challenge. And so obviously Everest is one of those, and uh, Kilimanjaro as well. And so, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have uh, four more peaks to finish before I complete that one, and I think that'll be my next challenge. And what's the next peak to complete that challenge, Alyssa? Yeah, well, I'm actually heading back to Mount Aconcagua in South America um, to complete that climb, and then next year will be uh, Denali in Alaska and Elbrus in Russia, and then uh, one more after that, which is Vincent in Antarctica. So, uh, yeah, hoping to sort of finish that in the next year or so. So, okay, so you're looking to get that, that wrapped up. Have you thought further ahead then um, than that, or that's as far out as you're looking at the moment? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, that's sort of my, my top priority, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, there's there's other challenges I still like to take on. There's other 8,000-metre uh, peaks in Nepal. There's 14 of the 8,000ers, and there's a few of those that I would absolutely be interested in climbing. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities still in climbing that I, I'd love to take on. So you said at the very start of the interview that one of your or that your greatest fear is not being fulfilled is there any fear that now you've conquered such an enormous uh, bucket list item, which, you know, people have as a bucket list but not really ever a real bucket list item, you know, it's just one of those things, um, <laughs> climb Everest. Is there a sense of a little bit of like, oh, gosh, will I ever be able to be fulfilled now? Yeah, I guess in a way. I mean, uh, it, there is sort of that feeling of, you know, when you're climbing Everest, you're, you're literally on top of the world. So, yeah, there is that thought but I think uh, I think. I'll be just as satisfied with a lot of these challenges I've got coming up and, uh, you know, maybe even one day potentially return to Everest and, and climb again. I don't know, but, uh, I think I'll, I'll continue to be fulfilled, but yeah, I think that that particular climb this year is, uh, probably one of the most special that, I, that I'll ever have. Definitely. Yeah. Wow. And your body pulled up. Okay. After it, did you have any injuries or, you know, ongoing residual side effects from the climb, Alyssa? Yeah, I mean, uh, just I think exhaustion after it. And it's funny how mentally you're so in that zone and, and focused on what you're doing because it's always after the expedition that that tends to happen. So it's almost like the body and mind sort of hold out. But, uh, yeah, once I got back to base camp, I mean, just the usual, I was I was quite sick after the expedition, but that's normal after what your body's been through. And uh, no particular injuries, and I was very lucky with frostbite. Um, we had a few of our team members evacuated because of it. And uh, so, yeah, but a few of us ended up just trekking out and yeah i was quite sick on the way down but uh, that's pretty normal after an expedition yeah okay and so Alyssa, um who are the sporting or you know not even just sporting but who are the people that you admire who do you look to yeah, you know, I think I would say probably people uh, close to me, both my parents, definitely. Um, their work ethic has is, is always inspired me. And, uh, yeah, you know, a, a few mentors that uh, have trained me over the years, I, I definitely look up to. And, uh, you know, being able to sort of be around like-minded people is, is definitely important to me. 
Is there one one person that's achieved things in particular uh, that in the, in the mountaineering world that you? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely there's a few, even female mountaineers that I, I sort of look up to. Um, you know, I know Melissa Arnott from, a, you know, an American climber, definitely. Um, and, yeah, I think there's a few different mountaineers that, uh, yeah, that have achieved things that I, that I would absolutely love to on, on different climbs, so... Yeah, wow. And uh, I, I, in research, in your tr- one of the people that was obviously in your, your corner helping you prepare, Chase Tucker, um, it was commented as saying, you're incredibly stern. You just focused on that one goal like nothing he'd ever seen before. <laughs> uh, actually, no, I, I didn't end up training with Chase. I, uh, I ended up training with another guy, Scott Evanett. So he does all of my um, physical and mental training for the climbs. Sorry, so correction. So it was Scott. Um, so, so what involvement was that like in, in, in your, your preparation with, your, you know, your coach? Yeah, so uh, I sort of came on board with him and we started working together right before this expedition, sort of uh, January, February this year, and uh, got into a, an extensive training program. And it's everything from nutrition right down to the physical and the mental training. And so, uh, yeah, we worked heavily together on that. And we were in a lot of contact throughout throughout the process. And, uh, yeah, he was a huge part of preparing me for it. And nutrition-wise, what did you do different to what you would normally do in, say, preparing for a Kilimanjaro? Jaro or a you know Kokoda trek anything markedly different with your nutrition yeah so uh, I mean it was quite strict a lot more than I had ever had uh, in the lead up to get as fit as possible but also sort of in the last few weeks it was actually important to put on a little bit of weight so that I would have weight to lose because you do lose a lot of weight when you're up high in altitude so that was probably the biggest standout thing was I needed to have extra weight to that I could then have that endurance up higher um, yeah on summer day Okay, so you actually, and how did you do that? Just ate more calories and did less exercise or <laughs> indulged? No, no, actually I trained pretty much right up until, um, except for sort of the week out. But, yeah, it's uh, still healthy, but, yeah, just a lot more carbs and, um, yeah, trying to sort of put on extra muscle in, in general and, uh, yeah, just have something to lose while I'm up there. Yeah, wow. And how many kilos did you end up losing, do you know? Yeah, it was, I think, 10 kilos in total, um, and that's a lot of muscle as well, so you pretty much strip down um, once you get back to base camp and your body's, uh, yeah, pretty worn out. Gosh, and you've rebuilt it all since? Yeah, so uh, it, it does come back pretty quickly. I mean, depending on, obviously, the climb, and, uh, yeah, so uh, it's come back pretty quick and I uh, had some time off, but, yeah, now I'm back into my training, so it's good. Okay, so back to Norm. And, and Alyssa, uh, for listeners that are out there seeking, you know, their physical best in all sorts of different different realms, what's the one bit of advice you'd give to people that want to pursue their physical best? Yeah, my piece of advice would be, Probably don't limit yourself, first of all. Um, have a lot of self-belief. I think that's definitely been the base of all of my accomplishments and uh, probably the most important thing to me. And, and, yeah, just knowing who you are I think is really important when, when pushing yourself and, and knowing what you're capable of deep down. Yeah, wow. Well said. And speaking from someone that's, you know, practicing what you preach too. Uh, Alyssa Azar, thank you for being a guest on the Physical Performance Show. Where can listeners track your journey uh, from here on, including your new venture with your father with the expeditions? Where can we find you? Yeah, so just online and, uh, you know, you can go to adventureprofessionals.com.au or even head over to my website, alyssarazar.com.au and we're also on Facebook. And so, yeah, get in touch and uh, happy to chat. Great. And listeners, will hook that up in the show notes. Uh, so jump over and, uh, and follow the, the journey from here. So Alyssa, sleep well. And uh, we look forward as a nation to seeing what achievements lay ahead in your already well-furnished life of, you know, 19 years. You truly are, you know, an exceptional Australian. And uh, as a dad of a young girl, three and a three-week-old, you know, I just think, wow, you, you are an incredible role model for many girls, you know, you know, who don't even know of you yet, but we'll be telling, telling this, your story to them as they grow. So congratulations and, and thank you. That's all right. Thank you and thank you for having me. So, there you have it. I trust you enjoyed this fascinating episode of the Physical Performance Show with Everest Summiter Alyssa Azar. 
what an incredible future this young lady has. If you enjoyed the episode, I'd love it if you could jump over to iTunes and leave a review for the show. If you have any questions or comments regarding today's show or guest, please shoot them over to my Twitter account. You'll find me at Brad underscore beer. A copy of the show notes can be found over at pogophysio.com.au. If you'd like more physical performance tips, be sure to also, while you're there, subscribe to the Pogo Press. You'll get yourself two free chapters of my Amazon running and jogging best-selling book, You Can Run Pain-Free. Coming up in next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, I sit down with four times Olympic Games representative, Australian marathon record holder, and holder of over five Australian distance running records, none other than Benita Willis. We have a fascinating look at her incredible career. Until next time, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.